Hey, this is Jay, and welcome to season two of Dilemma. If you'll indulge me for a bit, I'd like to confess some things and set my intentions for this season. I think season two is going to be quite different from season one, Uh, but in some ways it's going to be an attempt to achieve what I wasn't brave enough to actualize when I started. Don't worry, we're still going to get deep in the weeds of philosophy, psychology, politics, and science, and Coleman and I will still grapple in the time-honored arena of consequentialism versus virtue ethics and deontology, and I'll continue to make cultural references that he won't get. (laughs) But I think I can do better than I've been doing. One thing I want to do is allow this podcast to be more about philosophy in general rather than just the specific questions of moral philosophy. I want to convince you that all those strands of philosophy ultimately intertwine in ways that illuminate each other. This is to say that I will be posing thought experiments to you as ways into the conversation rather than always putting you in the seat of a moral dilemma. Really what I want to do is craft these episodes better. I'm a trained filmmaker, writer, and storyteller. I think, like all filmmakers, I also suffer from an acute case of imposter syndrome. I'm not a formally trained philosopher. I have no fancy letters after my name. I've taken a deep dive into the academic world of contemporary and classical philosophy since around September 11th, 2001, when I was already well on my way to a film degree. I stayed on that path and continue to explore my nagging philosophical curiosities through the medium of film. I still do that. I still make films. But film has a kind of safety of the medium that sits between the artist and the viewer. The filter of the objective lens and the screen allows you to take on the role of the passive presenter of a world rather than a subjective interpreter of it. I've always felt this was kind of a cop-out on my part. In the world of philosophy, political opinion, and the paradoxical subjective exploration of objectivity, this cop-out lens is also available. I can present what I find and read out there to you by citing references and quoting passages from established philosophers or popular writers, sometimes weaving together threads from different thinkers to create something that feels novel or is at least pointed at a new problem to see how it holds up. I'll continue to do this, of course, But there's another aspect of what I want to deliver that feels somehow bigger than that. I apologize if this is getting a bit esoteric, but maybe you'll be able to relate. There are those times when I sense that I have an original thought or a new argument, something that feels like mine. I'm standing on the scaffolding of other philosophers' work, I'm sure, but in those moments, I feel like I'm on my own, just floating in the winds of my own ideas. I can say something genuinely new. I wish I could say that I experienced those moments with less fright and more excitement, but that's the vice of the imposter, I suppose. Perhaps that's a good thing. It'd be nice to call the fright a kind of intellectual humility. I see too many pseudo-thinkers barge into these spaces without an iota of hesitation. I, I admire the confidence, but I also immediately distrust the motives, let alone the ideas themselves. So finding the courage to clear my throat and suggest I can enter that space with the right amount of self-doubt, humility, and confidence, that's what I feel ready to do. All of this is to say that season two may feel a little more like mine. Sometimes my guests won't be philosophers or trained deep thinkers, but instead everyday people who lived through dilemmas. That's where I'll try to play the role of in-house philosopher and pseudo-psychologist, I suppose. On a practical note, I also want to keep the episodes at reasonable lengths. I'm sure I won't always succeed at that, but I'd like to avoid the three-hour marathons and unguarded conversations. When I fail, and the subject itself resists compression under 60 minutes, I'll break it up into two parts and release them as individual episodes. I'm also shifting the format a bit. Coleman is a busy guy and has his own podcast, which is excellent. It's called Conversations with Coleman, and everyone ought to subscribe to it. He'll still join us here for roundtable discussions with the guests included this time, but he won't be on every episode. So I'm ramping up the production value here to tell a coherent story, introduce you to guests who will help me wade through the waters of the dilemma at hand and deliver a digestible conversation piece. 
I want to give you a philosophical idea to chew on at the top of each episode and then dive into the details of the real world and see where we land. I'll try to release episodes on the bi-weekly schedule, though there may be times when an episode requires a bit more time to craft. I'm actually also trying to write a book during all of this. And I want to thank all of you for listening to me. It's a huge honor to have attention for these matters, and I don't take the responsibility lightly. There are millions of podcasts out there, and somehow I get to be a voice that you hear. You can always find an archive of all of our episodes at dilemmapodcast.com. I also conducted a few recorded surprise hangout sessions during the COVID lockdown that are hosted on there as well, including an excellent conversation with Jamie Woodhouse on animal ethics and sentientism. You can find all that stuff organized at dilemmapodcast.com. And I hope you enjoy season two very much. I'm going to put plenty of care into it. And here comes episode one. Enjoy. I want to start this episode by giving you a short walkthrough of an oft-cited piece of moral philosophy. It has been described in many forms by Immanuel Kant, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, and others, but it's most often associated with John Rawls. It's called the Veil of Ignorance, and it could be dreamed up as something like this. Imagine I place you in front of a mirror and cover your face with a completely opaque veil. All you see is blackness. I then ask you to spin a giant wheel in front of you that will determine your new physical characteristics, your height, race, hair color, etc. The random wheel will also determine your place of birth, income, parents, etc. Picture a very bizarre game of Wheel of Fortune happening here. So you spin the wheel and it lands somewhere But remember, you're still wearing the veil and you can only see darkness. I then tell you that you are about to enter a new world and you are soon to be a member of the society in it. After this very strange experiment is over, you'll walk out of my lab and go live in that system. But now, with the veil still over your face, you get to design this new world outside the lab. You get to set all the rules and customs for it, how crime will be dealt with, how money would work, Uh, how governments might behave, how fires are put out, how wealth is distributed, how education operates, everything. After you design all the details of this world, the veil blocking your view is removed and you see your new self in the mirror for the first time. This veil, of course, was the veil of ignorance. Many high schoolers I work with are very attracted to this thought experiment. I think in large part because high school is when you kind of start to take off the blissful veil of ignorance of childhood, when everyone was sort of friends with one another, and you realize that you are entering a strange society and there are roles and cliques and hierarchies. You know, as their bodies rapidly change, you can picture high schoolers staring in the mirror and whispering, oh good, I'm the pretty cheerleader, or... Uh, I guess I'm the emo punk (laughs) or hey it looks like I'm the short drama kid the veil of ignorance is a bit like being cast in a remake of the breakfast club (laughs) this episode is all about discrimination in particular it's about lookism which is a type of discrimination which we rarely consider let alone talk about though upon slight consideration it's obvious how ubiquitous it is We can consider how we would feel if we removed the veil into this current 2020 society and realized that we were a black teenager or an Asian woman or a corn farmer in Angola or the Queen of England. These forms of inequity and discrimination get a lot of attention and study. But what if we remove the veil and notice that we are very attractive or very unattractive? These forms of discrimination garner almost no attention. But the veil of ignorance trick reveals these variables for what they are, random. The same thought experiment is also sometimes called the lottery of life, which reflects the random nature of existing in a world without asking to be here. And of course, not choosing your physical characteristics or the place of your birth or just about anything else. It's a random lottery before birth and here you are. So we face a strange dilemma when it comes to the problem of discrimination against unattractive people. This random physical trait can increasingly be corrected for with plastic surgery. In South Korea, this notion has gone extreme. 
In a recent study, it's estimated that between 20 and 30% of all South Korean women get plastic surgery. The trend for men is coming fast as well, with men altering their faces to achieve a K-pop kind of look. And of course, we all have a kind of digital plastic surgery performed on social media with a slew of filters and Photoshop effects. There's even a a touch up my appearance feature that is defaulted into the on position in Zoom conferencing. I'm not sure if you knew that, but it's there. (laughs) Maybe it's why you like it a little more than Skype or Google. South Korea presents an interesting special case of policy. There's a discussion there that employers should not be allowed to request a headshot or profile photo for job applications as to avoid attraction bias. I had a discussion with Francisca Minerva on the topic of lookism. She studies lookism, amongst other things. She is a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Politics and International Studies at Warwick University. And it was a wonderful conversation, which was recorded remotely due to COVID, as much of the season was. And I think you'll really enjoy it. I'll be back at the end to give a few final thoughts and more philosophical lenses in which to consider the problems of lookism. Also, pay special attention to the very delicate balance in this topic between the concepts of attractiveness and beauty. The idea of attractiveness is anchored by evolutionary explanations, bounded by signals of health and sex and reproduction which makes it a relatively stable concept in the history of the species and across cultures. Something like mucus dripping from one's nose is not very attractive for obvious reasons of signaling unhealthiness. And the other concept of beauty leans more towards socially constructed, historically contextual, fluid ideas that can shift quickly through time and space and location. So, okay, enough of me. Episode one of season two, and the wonderful Francesca Minerva. Lookism. It seems like one of those obvious biases or obvious prejudices, you could define how what you mean by it, um, that is just hard to talk about, almost because it's just so obvious, and then it has almost this built-in implication of, uh, you know, not wanting to sound like you're some beautiful person who's like, you know... Uh, disparaging others or vice versa claiming that you're unattractive it it, it carries with it this almost like impossible entry way to even open up the conversation at all so how did you do it (laughs) in the academic sphere it has been quite difficult so before starting this job university work i uh, had a grant at the university of ghent in in belgium and actually i will get back again to when I'm done with this project. So um, I think that was the first um, grant that was given to somebody to work on lookism. There's not really much work on it from a philosophical perspective. I think because it is one of these difficult topics in a sense, like when when I found some references to, to lookism or to discrimination based on attractiveness, it seems that the assumption that a lot of authors have is that it is not the same as um, other serious forms of discrimination, uh, such as um, sexism or racism. Um, so even if it's true that to a certain extent, um, attractive people are, have some advantages and unattractive people have some disadvantages, overall, this doesn't really have an impact on their life because... They, they think that it only affects romantic experiences. Mm. In fact, we have so much data and so many studies proving that that's not the case and that lookism has an impact on income, on um, job opportunities, yeah. chances of being promoted to find a job of, you know, to everything. Um, so I think it is quite similar to other forms of, discrimination that have taken and that have been taken way more seriously by philosophers and in the in the past decades i think i think i saw in one of your i don't know if this was your study but it was attractiveness was worth something like two hundred and thirty thousand dollars in buying power over a lifetime yeah yes that's a study by uh this economist um daniel hammermersh he pretty much spent large part of his career working on lookism and 
been an economist, he was very interested in assessing how much lookism costs and in these figures and have been found like pretty much the same kind of differences in income between attractive, non-attractive and average um, looking people in, in many countries. So we have quite consistent. I think that there's an interesting and useful split when we talk about this word attractiveness that I, that I, tell me if, if you agree with this split that you could talk about it in terms of sort of evolutionarily grooved uh, markers of attractiveness that maybe evolution has implanted us for reasons of sexual selection. Maybe these are things like sy- symmetry or, um, you know, good, even like good posture or muscles to take care of, you know, the young, all these kind of things that you could sort of trace back in some ways as an, as a natural phenomenon, as opposed to other things that are more societal, influences. And I think you talk about things like in a rich society, uh, attractiveness tends to lean more towards thinness, which might be a symbol of, um, I don't know, your, your wealth or something, and you can afford to, to have a special kind of diet versus in poorer societies, chubbier bodies can be more attractive. And so those, those kind of dials move pretty, you know, fluidly throughout the way societies change. Um, but there are some anchors that might be kind of just universal or eternal almost as long as we're biological creatures that like to have sex. Um, is that is that sort of a, a useful parsing of this word attractiveness? I think that's the, how you put it is, is right. That's what I understood at least um, by reading this literature for, for many years. There are pretty much two schools of thought and on one side the idea is that beauty is a byproduct of evolution. So those features that were considered a proxy for health and reproductive fitness now we are now considered like attract we're also considered attractive so whatever helps you to spread your genes and to survive in a certain environment is considered beautiful this doesn't apply only to people it applies to uh, everything to the environment what we find beautiful is what helps our survival uh, through through the evolution um, on the other hand is a rather school of thought according to which beauty is byproduct of societal preferences and in a sense is a form of oppression. How oppression is expressed, so people have these aesthetic preferences that reflect their uh, sexism or racism and um, their standards of beauty are a byproduct of this, of, mm. of this social um, and cultural preferences. And I think neither is right and both are right in a way. There is a grain of truth or quite a bit of truth in both approaches, but you need to take into consideration the features you're talking about. Mm. So if you're talking about features like symmetry or neoteny, which is how young you look um, or how feminine you look if you're a woman and how masculine you look if you're a man, um, how smooth is your skin? So these things that are really ingrained in our evolutionary brain, I think that the influence of society on these preferences is very little. And I don't think that society society really played a big role in determining these preferences. Indeed, we know from studies on very young children, a few weeks old, that they tend to find attractive, and we know that we suppose they find them attractive because they stare for longer at the same kind of people, same faces that their adults uh, find attractive. On the other hand, it is also true that society, of course, has an influence of our aesthetic preferences. And um, we know that a preference for like uh, thinness um, as is influenced by, by society, we're saying uh, by how rich and how much food is available outside the society. I think that the preference for Caucasian features mm-hmm. um, in most magazines is merely uh, cultural preferences. And there is no race which is more beautiful. There are beautiful people in all races. They're equally distributed. But it is for societal, cultural, economic reasons that this blonde, uh, fair skin uh, type of beauty is the most represented. And then people think that it's the only standard of beauty. Yeah. And they try to look like that. Uh, so 
we have to take into consideration what kind of feature we're talking about. Is blonde hair a universal standard of beauty? Is it part of evolutionary brain that we like blonde hair? No, it's not. Mm. Is symmetry an evolutionary uh, preference rooted in our evolutionary history? Yes, I think so. So we need to, to be careful. I think this distinction is particularly important uh, from the perspective of practical philosophy when we try to figure out how to... Uh, address lookism. If we are saying that, well, we need to solve this problem lookism, some people are less attractive, or we know the model, the, the standards of beauty are, are discriminatory, well, what should we do? Mm-hmm. If we think that it's just a problem rooted in societal preferences and we try to change standards of beauty through societal intervention, so portraying certain kinds of um, features, I don't think we're going to achieve much with respect to those features that we like for evolutionary reasons. I don't think we can do much to change our preference for symmetry, for yeah. instance. On the right. other hand, if we're talking about um, ethnicity right. and beauty and body weight and height and hair color, we can do a lot. So, so you, you're basically saying like no matter what societal knobs that will turn, we're never going to have like a preference suddenly for like yellow eyes because it's a, it's a, ingrained you know we sort of read that as like that's a symbol of disease or bad health which is bad for the genes and i don't want to you know mate with this person then like we can't overcome that but so in south korea let's talk about the south korea situation now and this case i don't know if how you explain it if this is sort of just like a runaway train of beauty memes that seem to lean western i mean skin bleaching body bleaching um, hair lightening, removing of the fold is pretty ubiquitous at this point. I mean, the estimates are pretty wild, like something like, I don't know, between 30 and 50 percent of women are getting at least some kind of surgery or say they want it. Um, and this has led to a real I don't I don't know how I don't know if you can explain how that phenomenon may have happened or this is just a strange case. Um, and then what we could possibly, if we decide it's a problem, what we could possibly do about it. Because the situation that it's resulted in now is people thinking that they can't get jobs or job offers without this kind of surgery. And then the, and then it gets even more complicated because getting the surgery is also a little expensive, which is also a symbol that you have that kind of money to waste, which is a symbol of, you know, your, your, so it just gets so, it gets so toxic and complicated there. I don't, I don't know how practical philosophy could even address <laughs> that problem. Yeah, I mean, I haven't studied uh, the case of South Korea specifically, though I remember when I was teaching some classes on lookism in Melbourne, I had some South Korean students mm-hmm. told me about it. Um, and you know, it was very common for people turning 16 to have cosmetic surgery as a present. South Korea might be an extreme, but it's important to notice, to remind that cosmetic surgery is very common and is practiced a lot in in a lot of countries. Um, even in years where there are like economic crises, the expenses on beauty and especially on cosmetic surgery are always growing. That's the only area that seems to <laughs> not suffer any um, problems from economic crisis. So people are investing more and more and more in looking attractive and um, and of course, it's in a sense, it's a self-feeding process because if the average of the people around you, the average look of the people around you keeps increasing, then you struggle to keep up. So if you were um, six, when I ask, one to ten, if you were a six and you know you were just like average, like everyone else, you didn't have particular advantage. But then, when everybody starts to get cosmetic surgery and becomes a seven or an eight, then you notice how oh, well should I be mm-hmm. disadvantaged? Maybe I can do some nip and tuck to to look uh, more attractive, so that I can also benefit from disadvantage, or at least not being disadvantaged at this point. And then you know it, it keeps it keeps going up. There are some important consideration. So as I understand this particular aspect about cosmetic surgery in South Korea seems to be that most interventions, if I understand correctly, are aimed at looking more Western like. So there is an element of so like ethnic cosmetic surgery, which is also quite common from um, people outside South Korea and South America and you know it, it, it is quite uh, well known 
and will study phenomenon. Um, so I think that for that, again, it seems to be mostly a problem of societal influence. So why did this myth of the Western beauty spread so much? Can we do something to replace this uh, Western standard of beauty with the Korean standard of beauty, uh, which is what these people naturally have. They're naturally beautiful according to, to, to their um, ethnic traits. So I think in that sense, if we if there was like a, a campaign to promote non-Western beauty, that could be quite successful. I say that because for instance, we know that people react quite quickly to what they see on TV. Mm. So there was this study in Fiji Islands. There was pretty much no case of anorexia nervosa. And then a few months after TV was introduced and a lot of Western people and Western models, like of course people on TV are the most attractive a portrait, they started having the first cases of anorexia. On the other hand, we know that experiments in which People, I think in this case it was women exposed to uh, different kind of features of women of all sizes and ethnicities felt more comfortable and more happy about their appearance than the ones that were exposed to, you know, features of, of models. So people react quite quickly to this. So in this case, when it comes to ethnic uh, cosmetic surgery, I think that by changing this uh, standard of beauty um, through portraying uh, Korean beauties on magazine and TV and uh, on the internet, um, a lot could be achieved. Yeah. That would be interesting to understand why in South Korea this is so common. I honestly have no idea about it, but I guess some maybe there are some studies about that, why it, it became so popular in South Korea and not, for instance, like in Japan. Yeah. But the, the kind of, uh, and you were saying also there is... Um, other kinds of cosmetic surgeries, like rejuvenating cosmetic surgeries, is quite common. That is a more difficult one. And indeed, I think rejuvenating cosmetic surgery is extremely common in the Western world as well. If you look around on on the internet or like on Instagram, it seems like there is no old woman and even women in their 50s and their 60s look younger than a woman in her 30 that hasn't done any rejuvenating cosmetic surgery. So sometimes I look at people 20, 30 years old and then it's like, oh, actually they look younger than me. So maybe there is something wrong with me. Um, so, and and that's that's a difficult one because, because of evolutionary reasons, women tend to are considered less attractive as they as they age. And that's a very well known phenomenon. Therefore the temptation to look younger is is very is very strong because you going to benefit from looking 10, 10 20 years yeah. younger can I, can I ask you a question these are all like just hot button kind of think you're dealing with race and ethnicity and um, I think what's really interesting I'm curious how you how we how we talk about these things without being misunderstood where especially when you're talking about evolution and explaining a phenomenon like a beauty standard of symmetry or height or whatever it is through an evolutionary explanation to, to, to just, you know, from that lens is oftentimes construed as a justification for it or an endorsement of it as this is the way it ought to be or something that we are foolish to try to think we can overcome or something like that. Is that, I mean, how, how do we talk about these things without uh, the kind of thought experiment to do is like, if you're saying, okay, evolution has ingrained these ideas of beauty into us for the reason of survival and procreation. And let's say I don't want to have kids or let's say like, this is no longer a problem. We can have genetic engineering, like, you know, kids can look, we can make them, I could have a, we could have two unattractive people historically in their society or even the way evolution says and have a baby, but they genetically engineer it to look like, you know, a supermodel. No problem, whatever it is. Like is, can we, are we stuck with the evolutionary um, kind of explanations or can we transcend those? Is that sort of a philosophical duty for us to uh, maybe I'm pulling in some sort of like veil of ignorance, moral ethic kind of thing to put on the table here. But do you find yourselves yourself in those kind of situations a lot where you're giving an evolution explanation and people are 
thinking you're a, it's a justification or an endorsement? Yeah, um, I think that's quite common. Um, the thing is that I'm not happy that things are the way they are, of course. <laughs> and um, it's it's obviously it would be better for everyone if we didn't have this kind of preferences. And in an ideal world that, you know, the way we look uh, shouldn't have any impact on, on our existence, on our life, how successful we are, how happy we are, how likely we are to find a partner. But that's, unfortunately, that's wish, wishful thinking. We have to deal with the situation we have now and how we're going to make things better for the people we're living now. We're stuck with evolution in a sense, but, you know, we're also continuing to evolve and we're also getting becoming able to, to modify our bodies and our brains as well. So it's not... Uh, absurd to think that perhaps in the future we will be able to re-engineer some preferences that we have evolved with or that maybe through natural evolution but maybe it's going to take much longer those preferences will will change because as you were saying it's true that during evolution through evolution in human history it was very useful to have this um, this clue Um, you didn't want to get close to a person that maybe had an infectious disease um, because that could make you die or you didn't want to invest resources in having a child with a person who was also affected by disease because then this child wouldn't be healthy, would die. So we, you know, we had to deal with a different set of problems. Obviously now we have complete different standards of life. We have medicines. And I think there is really that link between how healthy we are and how good looking we are is not that strong anymore though it is true to a certain to a certain extent like when you have a cold or you're really under the weather you have a flu you, you don't look as as good as usual i guess so there is still some connection there but our brain uh hasn't really kept up with that with that change in that link so our brain hasn't really um is not really capable of guessing that oh well even if this person is not really attractive she's really really healthy and therefore you know there is no risk in reproducing with her or with him and so on and so forth so maybe it will take a while to the brain to to adapt to that um but it could be a very long time and of course there's no use to tell people who feel now like they're discriminated against because of the way they look that oh well don't worry in two million years things will be different well thank you so much i mean now i'm not gonna be there in two million years so yeah i just want to i want to i want to peg that there because i think so far i failed to clear up that that you, we've been talking about lookism on sort of both end, ends of the spectrum, or I have being like very attractive, people are unattractive. You really tend to focus on the unattractive and the discrimination aspect of lookism. I just want to pin that there, that most of your focus is on that end, um, speaking at it uh, of it almost as like a, a disability. We do we, we give all kinds of, you know, grants and medical treatment and free things for people who just happen to be born with disabilities. We go out of our way quite a way to try to bring them up to a place where we feel like, oh, you, you got a bad a bad draw of the lottery of life. And so that just seems kind of cosmically unfair and we'll intervene as much as we can. But we don't do that for unattractive people. And that's really where you spend your time. I just wanted to peg that there because I feel like we should clear that up. Yeah, that's the main concern because, of course, I'm not really worried about people who have a lot of these advantages because they're very attractive. It's true that there are some studies suggesting that in some areas, very attractive people have some of these advantages, but overall, one is better off by being very attractive than very unattractive. There is so much evidence on, on this that, um, you know, it's, um, it's just very obvious. Like if you could choose you know, behind a veil of ignorance, should they enter the world and life as a very attractive person, as a very attractive one, and you had to compare the advantages and disadvantages, definitely you would go with being very attractive. But we also know that the advantage of attractive people and the disadvantages of unattractive people are not balanced. So it is more that the penalty on being unattractive is greater than the premium on beauty. Um, so it is a more serious problem. And it is a more serious problem because as a Trinitarian philosopher, I'm very concerned about suffering mm-hmm. uh, and how to improve 
uh, the well-being of people, how to reduce suffering. This form of differential treatment and discrimination is something that brings about a lot of suffering in, in the world. You mentioned that you, you're a utilitarian philosopher. So do you mind, because it's a, it's a subject that comes up a lot in, you know, in this podcast throughout season one and now I'm sure in season two of um, how you define that. It, you know, it has a lot of wrinkles to it. I think it gets, I probably am guilty of unfairly maligning it as some sort of oversimplistic pro and con list. I think at its base, it's something like that, but it's it's more, it can be much more nuanced than just sort of maximize flourishing, minimize suffering, and then washing your hands of it. It's, I mean, how, how do you start your, to build your moral framework of a criticism of as a utilitarian i think that um of course i mean utilitarian uh, philosophers are often accused of you know having these impossible standards and utilitarianism is not something people can really uh, live um by because it's very demanding and it's it's true in a sense you know it is very demanding but so are many other approaches to morality. For instance, if you take Kantianism very seriously, it's also extremely demanding. So morality is demanding in, in general. Then it boils down to what you think is the best way of going about your life and what kind of difference you want to make in the world. And I think that the best way to decide which course of action to take is to look at the consequences of our choices, our actions, um, so at the impact of, of things, rather right, the principle guiding some actions. In the case of, of Lukeism, I think that the main problem is not the concept of discrimination itself, but the fact that the people who are victims of this form of discrimination, other form of discrimination, experience lower standards of well-being and, and they suffer. And because of the consequences of Lukeism, I think we have a moral duty to, to intervene. And as a philosopher, I thought that the main duty was to actually make people aware mm -hmm. about this form of discrimination, because I noticed that our people would deny the existence of Lukeism at all. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, oh, no, no, that, that doesn't exist. It's not. Or they would think, oh, yes, there is this, this form of discrimination, but definitely I'm not doing it. <laughs> And I think that's the that's a good thing to start with, making people aware of their own lookism so that they can start thinking about it. As I often say, I mean, I think I was more lookist before I started working on this mm. and then started thinking on my own actions. So and they you know they can be like very small things, like um there are a lot of studies on on tipping, mm. uh, how people tip waiters not according to how good they are at doing their job but how attractive they are so is it true that we are like we're tipping more the attractive person than the other one or like are we paying more attention there is even like there are studies on how long for how long we sustain mm -hmm. eye to eye contact with an attractive person rather than an attractive one and you know obviously attractive people get more attention starting to act in this way so to make like to start making small changes yeah. in the direction and just making people aware of it, I thought was something that needed to be done because nobody else was talking about it. Yeah, it's like the, uh, the, the now very hackneyed check your privilege kind of calls for racial or other kinds of discrimination, the trek your privilege in lookism, it just is, is huge. And, and yeah, it's actually probably much more effective. You're right, just noticing it in yourself. Actually, with that question, I'm really curious as a utilitarian to get it to slide into the moral uh, philosophy part of it. Um, where do you think the sort of moral responsibility really lies in this situation is like the way the waiter it's almost a perfect experiment there because you have this fungible asset of a dollar that you that you could already sort of like you know count up what's happening and you have different waiters and you could just do the do the math if a waitress is like yeah i'm fully aware of lookism in our society um, and I'm trying to make money, so I'm going to wear a push-up bra or a padded bra and a little extra makeup because every time I do that, I come home with another twenty dollars. Versus the days I don't, so like, I'm going to do that. Is it is it our moral responsibility to be the ones that sort of like? This is very. I mean, when you, the, in the race conversation, this is almost unhavable. Of like, check your privilege, and then now what? Is that does that mean 
bring me as a white man sort of down to the to the place in American society where I might get more likely to be harassed for just jaywalking, which, you know, people of color are. Well, on the attractiveness side, does that mean like, well, okay, I, th- I think I'm pretty attractive on nights where I wear this makeup and then I get more tips. Should I not be doing that? Is it our more responsibility to like do that? Or is this more of a top down thing? Like the, the example of South Korea of like banning a government ban on um, employees demanding photos with job applications. Uh, where does the moral responsibility lie? I think we need to make a distinction between like a different um, kind of interaction and a different realms of life in which Lukeism m- makes a difference. Mm. Um, so when we're talking about indeed like job interviews and job applications, I think that we should try to reduce as much as possible the uh, role played by Lukeism or any other form of discrimination. For instance, I'm writing a paper arguing that we should use virtual reality mm-hmm. for as many interviews as much as possible. Because if all the candidates look exactly the same, sound exactly the same, and they're in this neutral environment, um, then we can really evaluate the competence of each candidate instead of being influenced by you know, the voice or the way they look. And this refers not only to, you know, the way they look in terms of being attractive or not, but also like their race and, you know, their gender. So using virtual reality, I think, would solve, would help solve so many problems when it comes to hiring, for instance. And, of course, there are other dynamics than one is hired, the promotion, etc. But I think we should really make an effort to have, you know, committees evaluating the CV of the person and then other ones like doing the interview in, either on the phone or in virtual reality if we can. And I thought some companies started doing that, they started doing interviews on, on in virtual reality. Hmm. I think we really should, that could really make a huge, huge difference. When it comes to personal interaction then, you will say, well, well you know, in personal interaction, if you are uh, looking for a partner or for a friend, then you are entitled to have your preferences they can be racist they can be lookist they can be sexist that's entirely up to you Uh, it's not a job it's your private life i think that something can be done in that respect as well and i think that in a way especially when it comes to dating for instance um introducing dating app that are based on features has really harmed um a lot of people were not extremely attractive and especially men i thought some statistics so some statistics about tinder pretty much is if you're not an extremely attractive man it's really useless to get on tinder because you're not gonna get a date men are more generous in their evaluation of attractiveness in women but women are extremely harsh when judging men attractiveness i've never used tinder i'm old enough to uh, to <laughs> fortunately to be spared that before you know, Tinder and smartphones and selfies and Instagram, people would meet through friends and school and work and they would interact and know each other at a different level. So, you know, even if the person didn't strike you as incredibly beautiful of meeting them by talking after a little bit, you would maybe get attracted to other characteristics. And I think that by focusing so much on appearance, like you can all swipe, and decide that the person is not attractive enough to even talk to them. People are really missing a lot of opportunities to have meaningful and happy relationships. And I think that's that's really sad. So again, I think virtual reality, for instance, could be helpful. I hope somebody will develop a dating app where people can meet virtual reality and talk to each other um, before they meet in person or and to have the time to develop an attraction which is not based exclusively on physical appearance but on affinity and yeah whether i include this or not i I was a uh i'll give a pitch because it was really kind of fun i I came in late as an editor on a on a a little reality show for facebook called um i think it was just called virtual dating and it was almost exactly this the idea was two people would go on a blind date in virtual reality uh, for the first time. And like, they were these interestingly crafted worlds. Some of them, the, I think the first episode was two like gamers. They like, they both like gaming in real life. They'd never seen each other. And then in virtual reality, that one was like this weird um, warrior princess, like 
avatar and the other one i guess like a tiger kind of thing whatever like fantasy creatures and they had swords and they had like this cool little blind date all in virtual reality that was crafted for them to like slay the dragon or whatever they did and then at the end of the show of course it's like the reveal is taking off the things and then uh seeing each other for the first time it was, it's actually a very cute show so maybe people are like open to the idea in some ways I think this is much better. Um, it's, it's 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 cute, yeah. Um, with the Tinder thing uh, and social media and Instagram and all of this, it's probably gotten even worse. That because we're talking about cosmetic surgery, but that's that's a whole layer of filters and all kinds of digital manipulation that you could do. That also seems to be, on a philosophical sense, there's the lookism problem, but also the distancing between your physical, actual self and this projection of your ideal that you know will play well in a marketplace of attractiveness, but you could never hope to even become yourself. The stories of people going into doctors and ask, telling them like, can you make me look like I've made myself on Instagram are like heartbreaking. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. This. Yeah. Yeah. And I think again, like in a way it's, it's messing up with our evolutionary preferences as well. For instance, I noticed that on Instagram, a lot of, teachers uh, or women that have done something to their to their lips i think now um, lip fillers are very common so there is up the upper lip shouldn't be bigger than the lower lip or the same size and i think the perfect ratio is like something like you know the lower lip should be like one and a half the size of the upper lip but now that has doesn't seem to exist anymore like so many people have these huge lips and i wonder if they're actually making themselves more attractive or not, or whether there is a standard of beauty that applies only to Instagram. And then in real life, that standard of beauty doesn't really apply. I I don't think it does because it looks incredibly uh, fake. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we know that, uh, you know, people can sense uh, the fakeness of, of a certain face. So I don't know if these people who are trying to become Instagram beautiful are then also like harming their chances of being attractive in in real life because these are already very beautiful women in many cases they just um, exaggerate some feature to be up to date to match the standard of beauty that only exists online else like extreme long eyelashes i mean it's it's completely different from mm. from what we know looks attractive in the normal world in which yeah. we interact and then people are comparing themselves with this, like, oh my God, my lips are weird because they're like the low upper lip is, no, no, that's that's perfectly fine. That's how you should look like. Um, so I'm also worried about spreading of harmful yeah. standards of beauty that are harmful also because they don't make you look prettier. Yeah, that's, uh, there's almost, this sounds very dystopian because when we started talking about the differences of attractiveness and if we focus on just sort of the societally grooved ones in, in X society, you know, this kind of look as attractive or whatever, well, there's almost just, or, or X nation or X cluster of population or whatever, wherever the beauty meme started to spread. Well, there's like a, there's a internet nation out there that probably people occupy a lot of their time in now that has its own kind of standards that is totally removed from a real world and and bad ideas or or just uh, South Korea we could pick on for being this particular geography of this but no like let's talk about the internet as a kind of geography a virtual geography that's also out of control yeah exactly I mean like there are people I mean skin pores have disappeared it seems nobody has pores in their skin how how did we change the, the the texture of skin so that it looks so smooth like not even two two weeks old children look like i mean that doesn't the kind of skin doesn't exist of course you constantly compare yourself to that oh my god i have pores on my skin something's wrong with me no you're human and mm. i think this is really um this is really affecting a lot of people to a degree that not even aware of um but even the people i think the problem is also that all these features are so manipulated filtered photoshopped that even the people who post these features don't look like themselves in those features so they cannot keep up themselves with the, their own standards of beauty so i think you know they keep they have to keep trying to 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 look like this better or like 
idealized but actually worse version of themselves and that's a lot of hard work yeah it's also video as well i just want to because i work in that field i mean it, this is not unique to instagram or still photos the kind of th digital makeup is actually literally what the process is called uh, in in post production with these uh, flame and other kinds of uh, programs, if any tech people out there know them, where you could go in and really you know remove the the wrinkle out of someone's corner of their lip for an entire movie or a video with a very precise kind of hand that that you can't uh, very very difficult to detect. So it's um, yeah, it seems like a rather rather difficult entrenched problem. But on the, I'm curious. This is more of an evolution question. What's happening with something like the pores thing? You can sort of identify the extremes that evolution would have given to you. Of like, I don't know, massively open pores as some sort of sign of sickness or not optimal health or whatever. And so it did it if it just embedded this little like small small pores are good or whatever. Um, but they don't seem to have an off switch that way. It's like, how did we then decide that zero pores or invisible pores, if it goes that it, does it always happen that that way? Or, or, you know, a lot of these beauty markers seem like you can you can understand the gradient that evolution would give you, but it doesn't seem that way. It's like, this is good and then we just go all the way the other other way yeah i think that it's it's difficult like even for me to keep looking at these things i can't get it like honestly with the upper lip thing i'm mm. really puzzled i don't know how we got there mm. i don't know if some celebrities started spreading this meme of you know having lips the same size and extremely big of course you know it's we, we are evolved to like not extremely thin lips but again we shouldn't normally be attracted by lips that look um the same size same things for for breasts so i was talking to some cosmetic surgeons and apparently people a lot of people ask for breasts that look fake mm, um look yeah. yeah that you know they want breasts that look oh, so so big but also like they're so projected um, like they're constantly, you look at you're constantly wearing a push-up. Mm. So I think that before, you know, the goal of cosmetic surgery was to make look people better, but natural, like they were naturally lacking in the beauty lottery. Even people were not, that was the goal. And now it's more like making them look fake or like, yeah. you know, like some standards of beauty that are completely fake and, I honestly don't know how we got there. Why would somebody want to have lips that look fake? Why would somebody want to have breasts that look fake? Yeah. And again, it seems that it's a complete different standard of beauty that has evolved independently from from what we, we can see. Yeah. It has some origin in, okay, we don't like saggy breasts, fine, you want, but like extremely protruded and projected breasts is also not something we should find attractive. And I, it, it, it's hard to explain how that yeah. developed. Is there a name? I think like in, um, for the phenomenon of race, they just, it was like the contact hypothesis of, um, just if kids grow up around other kids, just literally in contact with other kids from different races, like it actually just does a lot of work on its own being in contact with them. Is there, is there a kind of a similar phenomenon with attractiveness, that whole phenomenon of, I, I think you mentioned it before, of like maybe having a friend for a while or getting closer to someone who at first, like, you know, there was no spark, you weren't super into them. But after like a month, you're like, I think I'm developing a crush on Dave or whatever, even though you don't find him like crazy attractive, the phenomenon of familiarity leading to uh, affection and then sexual attraction just sort of comes along for the ride. Is there, is there, if there's a name for that, tell me what it is and more about the phenomenon. And is that potentially explaining of maybe people who are just inundated by on Twitter of being in contact, at least visual contact, not developing relationships with individuals, but in contact with that standard beauty and that meme of beauty, eventually you're like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm into it now. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's possible. I think that again, in this case, the influence of society has, is enormous in that in a sense, it even overcame evolutionary preferences, at least for, for some people. I think it started with Photoshop, probably. Mm -hmm. Up to, I don't know, two, three decade, decades ago, women were only comparing themselves with 
beautiful women that anyway were still normal. Like I was looking recently at pictures of Marilyn Monroe, Mm -hmm. who is considered one of the most beautiful women. But now I think she wouldn't be considered beautiful. I was noticing she had a little bit of a belly. She had a little bit, Mm -hmm. you know, she was a bit chubby. I was asking myself, would she be considered attractive now? Would she be as famous? Probably not. Because now we have all these people who are undergoing cosmetic surgery and can delete any minimal defect in in their body or in their face or look completely completely unnatural. Like in a sense, like something you were mentioning before, it is a status symbol. So if celebrities are doing that, if celebrities think say it's okay like to look like a Kardashian. Um, then you know there's something good about it. Then I can prove that I'm also um, rich and have the resources to afford cosmetic surgery. I think maybe there's a problem not being able to distinguish the real world from mm. from the internet world. There's a conversation about porn as well. How porn really changed um, male preferences for how women should should look like, and I think for. A lot of, I mean, one thing that I think is really strange is how vaginoplasty became very common, like cosmetic surgery to the vagina. And I was yeah. really puzzled by this phenomenon, like, why are people doing that? Like, no, you don't <laughs> go around with your vagina exposed. Um, so why does that matter? Where else? So in some cases, of course, you know, some people have some affirmation, it's comfortable, they need, but in most cases, you know, it doesn't really matter how your vagina looks like. Turns out that there is a type of vagina is really common in porn, and then men, men start expecting their partner to have a vagina that looks like that, and women somehow mm-hmm. became aware of that and started requesting a lot of cosmetic surgery in the vagina. So there is no area of the human body, literally nothing, that is not now subject to scrutiny and is not compared with this idealized uh, version of women or men that are either in porn, on Instagram, on magazines. And it is exhausting for everyone. Yeah, exhausting. I mean, it's exhausting to listen to. (laughs) I mean, honestly, just like, yeah, every single part. So... (laughs) To, to try to end it with a couple minutes of talking about potential solutions, we talked a little bit about um, top maybe top-down sort of uh, restrictions or VR or maybe banning these companies in a place like South Korea of like, no, no, you, 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 we just, we'll, we'll make it illegal to send photos with your, your um, you know, job application or something. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts on sort of representation in media. It seems we just have to admit that we're incredibly influenced by the images around us and in film and in TV and in advertisements, et cetera, now all over the internet. Um, and it's a big, again, the, the relations or the, the analogies to racial conversations are just need to be made here because the conversations about representation for black characters or gay characters or whatever on TV, I think is a really interesting thing. Does, does, does television or entertainment have a moral responsibility because of this psychological um, landmine that it puts in everyone's sort of brain um, to, to treat it uh, carefully and to maybe not just be a mirror of society if society is racist, but actually have take a moral stand to, to, to use the tool of representation of celebrity in a way that could affect change. We've ne- as far as I know, we've never seen anything like that for lookism. I don't see anybody crying for like, we need more ugly people on TV because we need to, I don't know, represent them better or, but maybe, but maybe it's a different problem because if it was like, if there was a racism problem saying people, you know, discriminate against Brown or black people. So we're going to put them all over your TV and guess what? They're also really attractive. So you're going to like it and eventually you'll like them more. And that's a great way to penetrate through really awful racism is being attracted to them. Um, well, I don't know if putting an unattractive person on TV does that on its own. Uh, it, it has its own sort of challenges. I mean, I think that one step at least that should be done, I think some companies are doing that, is to not airbrush Photoshop like yeah. the models that they use for their products. I think it was on underwear and some clothes. I think the UK banned it or are they... Did the UK the, does the UK have a regulation now where they like do, you have to declare if it is or something? I know there was a hubbub about this. Maybe yeah. maybe they do. 
um, maybe also France, um, yeah. and I think France also has a regulation of the minimum weight of models, for instance, like you can have really mm. skinny models anymore. Um, at least starting to show people we're still attractive, but like still look human. <laughs> um, so like not photoshopping people or uh, modifying them in a way that even they don't look like themselves yeah. in, in in the commercial. So starting doing that would be, be great because people look, oh no, there are people who age. This is how a 30-year-old person looks like. This is a 50-year-old person looks like. There's nothing weird with me. And I think, yes, it would be good to have a quota. So there is, in part, it's true that we, you know, we maybe get more pleasure from watching a movie where the actors are extremely beautiful than movie where actors are not extremely beautiful, like they're unattractive. But again, um, have we really tried that? Not, not, not much really. And um, maybe, you know, maybe we can, we can give it a try. Maybe we can try to start using in uh, hiring slightly less attractive people yeah. and less less and see how it goes if people start developing maybe we actually can enjoy movies even if you know brad pitt or another mm-hmm. are not in them anymore so yeah i think i think it would really uh make a difference to stop photoshopping and introducing people who don't really fit yeah. this standard of beauty which at the moment is really narrow it doesn't yeah. need to be this narrow there is no reason this this seems like again that that waiter analogy if you had if the movies and the producers themselves were analogous to a bunch of waiters in a restaurant all fighting over tips it, there's a there must be a name for this problem of no but nobody's going to do it on their own unfortunately because of this truth of human psychology and you're a producer being like Oh, Francesco's telling me to to put like a less attractive lead in my film that I just invested, you know, hundred million dollars in. But the data says like I'm going to make less money. Like no one, no one's going to. The free market might not ever solve this one. Um, so as much as like a libertarian ethic wants to be applied to this, I I have trouble seeing it actually not just spiraling out of control even more so just to start from the people i think we had we had some success so i mm. mentioned before that there are some companies they're not photoshopping um and modifying the features of the models and i think it didn't start from the company i think they they noticed they saw on online and i said mm. they were like this um movement yeah. for you know appreciation of you know curvy people and you know people of different real bodies i think dove beauty was one of the early ones yeah Yeah. exactly so there is now i think a demand people want to see that at least some people do and the number of people that seems to be growing um i think people don't really like feeling mortified in a sense Mm -hmm. being constantly exposed to uh, the standards of beauty of the people who look so unnaturally beautiful and so extremely beautiful. I think that maybe there's need to be a change in the sense of like paying more attention to what people really want. And then, you know, it may be that I'm wrong. It may be that actually people want to watch a movie where the actors are not incredibly beautiful. It's hard to know how much of that is signaling as well. If people are joining an online movement or if a hashtag goes around and there's a big movement of like, we want real bodies. But, the, but then the companies are, are tracking all of their Instagrams and their porn preferences or whatever. And they realize like, you know, a, they're just signaling like I, it's a I feel this one feels so ingrained because someone could say that they are like, um, you know, not discriminating and, and love all races and everyone looks the same and they would date a fat person or a skinny person. They could say all that. But, you know, when push comes to shove, those are like primal passions that feel beyond our free will to control. I think there's there's a bracket there, which is why I'm, I'm so perplexed by solutions on this one. As another as just another anecdote and example, my girlfriend and I were, were recently in Peru back when we can travel right before the coronavirus stuff started. And there's like open markets there and this incredible, this is a perfect analogy as well, just like the waiter things. And it's very uncomfortable. We're, we're there as tourists. So we're obviously the ones with the money and you're in these open markets and there's just a line of literally like identical juice shops. I don't know if you've ever been to Peru. They have like these fruit juice shops everywhere. It's really good. They mix guava and 
you know, papaya and oranges, whatever else you can get, whatever. You want. And they're just, they're all identical. They're literally the same menu, the same machine, just like a row of them, all each of them with a different woman at each of them. <laughs> and they're all overly made up and all calling out to you to be like, Hey, and you know, come get my juice, whatever it is. And, you know, my girlfriend and I were thirsty and we wanted juice. And then we're suddenly faced with the dilemma of like, which one of these literally identical stands are we going to choose? And I don't know. It's like we should have just like closed our eyes and rolled the dice or played like a, <laughs> like a number game between us. We went to, I don't know, the fourth one down and she was lovely and made us a nice juice. But like you're, you're like, I could have gone to any of these. And yeah, it's like it's it seems like an, an and, and I don't know, it's impossible for us to get behind what we could have been aware of it like you're saying maybe that's the best we could do of like okay i'm aware that now my attraction bias is engaged for all of these women and uh i'm going to try to transcend it in this moment and make some divine choice for for the right orange juice um but i don't i can never get behind that maybe i did pick the most attractive one i have no idea we did it together we i don't know we just like went blindly to one of them <laughs> She wasn't even the closest to us. So I don't know what was happening. <laughs> no, I, don't, I mean, it's, 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 it's difficult. I'm yeah. saying, you know, I don't think there is like one solution that you apply to all cases, to all situations that solve all the problems. And I think this takes a lot of thinking. And I'm, I'm glad that now there are more people working on this topic than when I started six years ago. Um, there is more thought going into that. And I think it will require so much thinking and effort from you know, the individuals um, who are in, normally engaged in Lucas practices. And, you know, I say that about myself and, you know, everyone else um, yeah. is doing that to a certain degree. There, there must be a dating site with no photos. I haven't done the research on it. There must be one. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I would hope so. I've never use a dating app, so I don't know. Of course, I mean, I'm also Lucas in my relationships. Like, I mean, uh, yeah. I wouldn't say my boyfriend... Is, is is ugly not at all so i mean <laughs> there are some levels of which like still mm-hmm. you know it's it's our preferences that that matter a lot in our in our decisions but i would like to think that you know when we choose a partner for instance we don't look only the way uh, their appearance but also a lot of things and and this should be the case um for for other areas or other like personal interaction like friendships yeah. and you know professional collaborations and all sort of things obviously i think that the internet and the fact that we're constantly exposed to people's appearance make that like, makes that very very difficult yeah um, we often interact through twitter and facebook and that are you know and we see each other's face mm-hmm. um as the first thing that that wasn't the case 20 years ago. Gosh, this is a, I could talk to you all day. This is such a hard problem. I've, uh, cause I'm almost thinking like the, um, when you're talking about your boyfriend, of course, I think my girlfriend's attractive. It's like, it, it, we're stuck in that. And you almost want to say the bad answer to all of it is like, well, this is a defense for like arranged marriages where you never even see your partner. It's just totally like your family picks for you. And then you're forced to marry this person. It has nothing to do with your attraction to them. It's like, this is a partnership and you just need to do this. And then there's this tons of social pressure to stay together, obviously about shame and the family and all these other things. It seems like that retreat from the problem of attraction bias is, you know, the laziest, most fascistic sort of response to it. And, and, but I don't know, it it almost gives you sympathy for the impulse to even try something like that. Cause you're like, well, they're, they're, they're trying to address a real problem, maybe very, with worse consequences as a utilitarian you might be like well you know the the math doesn't add up for them so yeah i, I mean know. obviously like it's important to say i have also dated people who didn't think they were attractive but mm-hmm. uh, physically at all uh and then but i was attracted to them because they were smart and, and funny and it had things but and i think that a lot of people had the same experience like in you know ending up with dating someone who they didn't think they were they would be attracted to mm-hmm. but i think that that's not going to happen anymore if people rely on you know on dating app in which the picture mm-hmm. is the thing they are supposed to, to judge that person on so again um, i think that from this perspective like the internet has really i mean in a sense it's created more opportunity to meet a partner because now you can meet people living on the side of the world and start chatting to them 
and you can chat with you know 10 different people in a day but it has really given physical attractiveness a prominence that it didn't mm. it didn't used to have before fortunately so there is something we can we can do that and obviously also like people have different uh, aesthetic preferences in a sense so i think there are limits to that there are some people that everybody consider considers unattractive and some people that everybody considers attractive but within that you know I, I keep talking about attractiveness and unattractiveness, but of what I really mean is like beauty and, and ugliness because attractiveness is, is, is a more complex phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And I think we can be attractive when we have like some, some other features, but those features need time to, to be discovered and be familiar with. And if we're only stopped by this first interaction in which you know, we stop the attractiveness, then it becomes very hard. And again, the internet has made, has made that very, very difficult. It's almost like the, I don't know, you spent m- way more time in these definitions than I have, attractiveness and beauty. It's almost that like sexiness is the word that we're really uh, criticizing here because it has a more evolutionary kind of appeal to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I use physical attractiveness for basically because that's the term that is used usually in the literature. Yeah. No, not probably sure it, it's it's the best when you look at it from you know mm-hmm. philosophical perspective because you know being attractive is the capacity to attract people to you for probably a, a number of reasons which physical attractiveness obviously plays an important role but it's not the whole story as many of us have, yeah. have experienced in their life so for a defense of the word attraction i my favorite definition of it is the opposite of attractiveness is not ugly it's boring so being <laughs> That's non, a good one, yeah. yeah so being non-boring is a way and we know that is a, is an attractive quality in all kinds of ways. And that maybe that's what actually needs to be promoted more than, as you're saying, physical attraction or sexiness as, as being cause sexiness, you know, is not boring in some regard, but it's boring in a lot of other, <laughs> or it doesn't guarantee n- non boredom in the things that obviously matter when it comes to hiring someone or a mate or anything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you know, that's very obvious when you're hiring someone, as you were saying, but also like when you're in your, personal interaction you don't want to be stuck with a person who's really beautiful but it's also incredibly boring you're not going to have a good life so there is some some balance there um that that we need to find maybe we should end it there it's a nice it's a nice sort of hopeful you know peak of light in a in an otherwise kind of depressing conversation so uh maybe we should end it there so if people want to find out more about you uh your website has all kinds of like your academic writing uh and publications and videos is that the best place for for people to interact with you? yes yes and it's just francesca minerva.com right yes great easy to remember well thanks so much that was like super super, super thank interesting you conversation. thank you so much So I really enjoyed that conversation, and I hope that there was plenty for you to take away from it as well. Uh, Upon listening and editing, I lament the lack of solutions that were offered here. Um, You know, lookism seems to be such a difficult problem to address, but I do think its day is coming. Uh, Here's some of my closing thoughts. What's odd to me is that we have decided that certain levels of extreme unattractiveness should be met with sympathy and charities. I'm thinking here of cleft lip advertisements on the subway. Uh, If you've seen them, Operation Smile is a charity that's been around for 38 years now and performs surgeries on this birth defect. Uh, The defect can have minor medical dangers such as difficulty suckling for babies, though that can be pretty easily overcome with custom bottles. For the most part, the defect, if we can call it that, is that it renders the person less attractive, and the upturn in the lip is considered unsightly. It also appears at birth, in babies. Looking at a baby reminds us just so obviously how they didn't choose to be born and are innocent. They very recently played the bizarre Wheel of Fortune Veil of Ignorance game from the opening segment of this episode. Their lifestyle choices or diet or exercise can hardly be a factor for their appearance as three-month-olds. This cleft lip is just pure chance. 
We also hold the same kind of sympathetic view for people with abnormal growths or strange birthmarks or other kinds of deformities, especially on their faces. But these seem to be special cases where the physical manifestation of something unattractive is just very obvious and common enough to be considered an unfortunate condition, which we should intervene in and correct for anyone so unlucky to have been struck with them. But somehow we harbor a strange disdain for people who simply think their nose is a little too large or chin too weak. Presumably, as babies, these features looked fine, but as an adult, they grew oddly and now are out of place. We react as though these kind of unattractive conditions don't amount to a sympathetic bad break and that we should set up charities to fix. Fixing slightly off noses through plastic surgery feels unnecessary and vain, and some people get the distinct feeling like it's somehow cheating to correct them. Even though, again, no one would dispute that they are just as randomly dispersed as a baby with a cleft lip. I'm not entirely sure what's happening here, and it sounds like Francesca isn't either, but we can all see the problems and dangers that this kind of aesthetic obsession is causing us. I have a guess and a strange analogy of what could be going on. Perhaps we have a kind of evolutionary mate-seeking playground in our minds. Something like an amusement park ride, but at the entrance, instead of a sign reading, you must be this tall to ride this ride, there's a post that says, you must be at least this attractive to be able to compete at all in there. We think everyone has a right to enter, so we'll fix that growth or cleft lip, but a big nose or a small chin or a heavy brow, those all pass the test, so you get to enter the playground of society and have a fair chance. But this analogy fails because a roller coaster is fun for everyone who gets to ride it, and everyone at every height as long as they meet the minimum requirement. What we know is that the playground of life is more fun and more lucrative when one has more attractive points. This is now starting to sound a bit like a sympathetic manifesto for the incel community. If you are somehow first encountering that word incel, it stands for involuntary celibate. I've peered into their online community a bit out of curiosity, and the darkness of their discourse is disturbing and unhelpful. There certainly are plenty of teenagers who just need to relax, wait for their acne to clear up, and work on their confidence. But their plight is not completely imagined, and in the philosophical community, we should think of genuine solutions that are more creative than the ugly anger that swells in them. Let's also take a moment to consider that not all signals of physical attractiveness are just dice rolls of genetics, but much of it is signaling of values. If someone is very fit and lean and you find them attractive, this makes sense in that those appearances might be the result of good hygiene, self-care, good diet, and discipline, all good values to display as a parent or romantic partner. Someone very overweight and dirty might be signaling laziness and impulsivity and selfishness, which might make you think twice about partnering with them and folding their genes into yours. This, of course, is just experienced as not being attracted to someone or being even repulsed by someone. So physical attraction is obviously very complex, and we're dealing with a lot of factors here. Those who wish to deny the truth of evolution and say things like physical attraction is entirely a social construct are sadly unlikely to be very helpful here. The tension between the brackets of our evolved senses, in the case of this episode, sexual attraction for certain phenotypic traits, and our moral explorations of what we know is right, is going to be a theme not just for season two of Dilemma, but for the human species in the next 100 years. I think we can see the moral path somewhat clearly with something like lookism when we recall the veil of ignorance thought experiment. From the standpoint of that simple lottery of life, which reminds us that our physical attractiveness before the aid of makeup, plastic surgery, or our lifestyle choices like diet or exercise is just as random as our height, hair color, or skin color. And thus, discrimination and biases based upon it are just as vile as the racism we always hear so much about. Francesca finds a moral correction, rightfully with the elevation of the notion of beauty rather than physical attraction. Beauty being the kind of deeper worth of a person. In a more perfect world, 
This would matter more than signaling sexual appeal through the blind impulses of evolution to procreate and duplicate genes. But climbing that mountain is fighting a part of who we are that is deeply entrenched. As we so often have to do in philosophy, we have to ponder if we want to transcend our evolution and craft a more moral world around us, and if so, how. As Francesca points out, perhaps the first step is to simply become aware of the bias in the first place. I'm glad she's on the case. I encourage you to seek out some of her publications on her site. Not all of them are in English, by the way, but most have translations. And if you are interested in further reading and digging into some of the data we mentioned, Daniel Hammermesh wrote a book called Beauty Pays, Why Attractive People Are More Successful, which has plenty of data and tries to calculate the beauty gap. There's also a book titled The Beauty Bias by Deborah Rode, which focuses a bit more on the legal aspects of discrimination against unattractive people. I hope this topic gets plenty of attention, and I trust if you pay a bit of mind to it in your daily life, you'll find it everywhere. Episode two is a bittersweet episode. I've recorded it with Emily Thomas, who wrote a book this year called The Meaning of Travel, and it hit the shelves just about at the same time that coronavirus ground international travel to a halt. But we had a lovely conversation about her absolutely charming book. We shared stories of our travels in life, and we take a stroll through her book, which is full of fascinating histories of the philosophy of travel, and has tons of beautiful and funny stories with anecdotes like bear leaders of the grand tour in Europe, a village in Alaska where it is always Christmas, a re-examination of the word sublime and if man-made objects can amount to it, the political complexities of map making, and a nod to a genuinely American addition to philosophy which I, as a beleaguered American at the moment, can celebrate. You may also be hearing that I'm recording this little bit outside. Uh, I think that's also going to be a bit of a theme for season two as some of my in-person recordings with Coleman and other guests are going to be recorded outside, which of course at the moment is a bit safer and easier to accomplish with social distancing. So thank you so much. Enjoy season two. Find me in two weeks.